everyone, and welcome to Registrar Corp's webinar entitled um, U.S. FDA Drug Detentions, Causes, Consequences, and Tools to Assist. My name is Clay Blondin, a marketing specialist at Registrar Corp, and today's moderator. The presentation will conclude with a live questions and answers session. If we run out of time, we are also happy to respond to your questions by email. You may submit a written question anytime during the webinar by using the Ask a Question feature in the top center of your webinar screen. A recorded copy of this presentation will be sent to all registrants. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Melissa Sayers holds a Master of Science degree in Oceanography from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. She joined Registrar Corp in 2012 and has specialized in drug electronic submissions, including drug establishment registration, product listing, self-identification, and electronic common technical document submissions for drug master file and abbreviated new drug application submissions. I'd like to go ahead and begin. Ms. Sayers? Thank you, Clay, for the introduction. No problem. So let's get started. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So today we will be focusing on what happens when a shipment is stopped by the United States Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, upon entry into the United States, and what to do if that hold becomes a detention. After today's webinar, you should know what is a detention and why you don't want your product detained. You know about common causes and learn about the available tools you can use for assistance. So this big, scary word, detention, what is it exactly? FDA stops shipments for inspections for a few possibilities. Sometimes it is complete random. It may be based off a PREDICT score that we will explain in further detail later. There may be something about the documentation that raises questions or concerns by the FDA. And this will be a cause to stop the shipment from proceeding. The first notice of action is commonly referred to as an NOA for short, commonly indicates that the product is being pending on testing or further review. At this point, the shipment is not detained and nothing further can be done until further notice from FDA. If a shipment contains product that does violate or appears to violate FDA's laws or regulations, then FDA can detain your product. Detain is to hold back or keep from proceeding. When FDA deems there are grounds for detention, a notice of action will be issued with detention. While a product is under review or detained, the products within the shipment that are in question are not to be used, moved, altered, or tempered with in any way. The product will be required to be stored at the company's expense during that time. Detentions happen because the product is out of compliance, usually. A product out of compliance poses safety concerns for the consumer. Regulations are made to protect the consumers from potential harm. Therefore, when products are contaminated or made under insanitary conditions, the product may be unsafe for use. Labels that contain false or misleading information could pose harm to the consumer if incorrectly used. Unapproved new drugs have been shown to be, have not been shown to be safe or effective, and these pose potential dangers to the consumer. There are also restrictions on where the product may originate from that the agency has deemed unsafe for consumers. Also, if an establishment is not duly registered or a product is not listed with FDA, the product can be detained upon entry into the United States. Okay, now we understand what is the detention, you know, the shipment's held back. When it can, so when can it be detained, and why these detentions may occur, okay? So now what happens when your product is declared detained? Now what do you do? When a product is detained, FDA issues a notice of action, which is also a notice of detention and hearing by mail, either to the importer or customs broker. The importer or custom broker can also access the notice of action electronically through the automated commercial environment system, 
or ACE for short. The notice of detention and hearing will include a respond by date. Evidence must be provided to FDA that either provides support, that either resolves, correct, or inform how the charge is an error. This notice will also include charges that outline parts of the laws and regulations that were violated, as well as a description of the law and regulation, and a note what is missing or incorrect, which may be vague or detailed by FDA. These are referred to as the charges. Okay, so here is an example of a notice of action. It will be quite clear that the product has been detained. The respond by date will be after the product description along with the charges below. So here we have charges for adulteration and misbranding. And the respond by date is November 21st, 2014. Obviously this is an older uh, notice of action, but at least now you can see where to look on the notice of action. In addition to naming the law and regulation that the product violates, FDA does provide a summary in how the product violates the act. So you can see, you, know, you have the citation, but also a description of what it is and how it's being, how it violates the law or regulation. So now that your company unfortunately received a notice of action with detained products, what do you do about it? You need to first understand the charges, which we will go into more detail about. Once you understand what the charges are, then you can work on obtaining evidence to overcome the appearance of a violation. Your response with evidence will be the testimony. If the product requires reformulation, repackaging, or relabeling to overcome the charge, then a request for recondition of the product will need to be submitted and approved by the FDA compliance officer in order to proceed with the process. If neither a testimony or request to recondition the product is not received prior to the deadline, then Customs and Border Protection, CBP, as well as the FDA can require that the product is either destroyed or export the product from the United States within 90 days. This, of course, will be at the company's expense. The evidence you submit to support the release of your product is the testimony, and this is submitted to FDA point of contact on the notice of action known as the compliance officer. The evidence can be provided to the compliance officer in multiple ways, such as email, fax, post a mail, phone call, for a form, or you can request for a formal meeting. It is best to save a record of what is transmitted, keep record of any tracking information when mailed, Use read receipts, delivery of notifications, and you can also submit electronically through the Import Trade Auxiliary Communication System, also known as ITAX. You can find the contact information for the compliance officer at the end of the notice of action. So either you as an importer or as a manufacturer who shifts over product is informed that a notice of action has a detained product. So what do you do? It is time for the hearing portion of the process. This is where you provide the testimony, whether it is through a phone call, email, mail and evidence, fax, or even a formal meeting. The hearing officer is commonly the FDA compliance officer that is listed on the notice of detention and hearing. So you are working on gathering all the evidence for the testimony. It is important to know when to have the information by and if it is possible. That is why the respond by date is so important to know. According to FDA's regulatory procedure manual, the manual allows 10 business days for a response. Often the compliance officer will provide 20 calendar days to provide a testimony. These additional days accommodate for weekends and holidays. If there is no response, then the compliance officer issues a refusal of admission, at which point the shipment must be destroyed or exported out of the United States at the company's expense. So what if the respond by date is not enough time to provide a testimony or some every condition a product request to resolve the matter? An extension may be requested. If the compliance officer grants the request, 
an additional notice of action will be issued with a new respond by date. If there is any confusion, being in communication with the compliance officer is important. So your company is working on gathering the evidence and trying to get this done before the respond by date. The person to be in contact with the compliance officer is either the importer, consignee of record, custom broker, or an authorized rep representative such as Registrar Corp. Registrar Corp has a lot of experience with communicating with compliance officers and can handle the communications with the compliance officer to help facilitate the release of a detained product. If you miss the deadline to provide your testimony by the respond by date, the compliance officer will more than likely issue a refusal of admission. The refusal notice will state why the product is being refused, or if your evidence is insufficient, then FDA can issue a refusal. When a product is refused entry into the United States, it must either be destroyed or returned to the sender at the company's expense. However, if FDA determines that the product is not in violation, it will be released for entry into the United States. Here is a sample of a notice of refusal of admission. You can see in the first red box, it states in all capital letters, refusal of admission. The next page of the notice gives the explanation to why the product was refused. Now that you have submitted a testimony to the compliance officer, now what happens? You want to make sure you do follow up with the compliance officer to confirm receipt. The compliance officer can wait for the respond by date to make a decision. You will either be asked for further information, be issued a notice of refusal at which point the product must be destroyed or returned to sender at the company's expense. Or the best result is receive an updated notice of action that states the product is released. So the unfortunate happens. The product is refused is not granted entry into the United States. This can happen for several reasons. Testimony was not provided before the respond by date. Efforts to either relabel or recondition a product were not satisfactory. So now the product must either be exported out of the United States under the supervision of the Customs and Border Protection, CBP, or the product must be destroyed by the Customs and Border Protection. There are different types of release notices issued by FDA. So this is what you want to see. A release is what you are hoping for. So there is a release which indicates that the article is in compliance and there were no issues were detected. There is a release without exa examination, which is the risk man management system that determines if it is a low risk or if a compliance officer issues that, um, then he can also issue a release without examination. And the importer is responsible for ensuring that the product complies. If the product is not fully compliant, but the issue is not considered major, then the officer may release with comment. It is important to read the comment by FDA and fix before the next shipment. Just because the product was released this time is not a guarantee that the next shipment of the product will not be detained. If a product was detained, a release notice will state release after detention. This happens when the testimony or reconditioning was adequate in correcting the issues. Whenever possible, make the effort to not make the same mistakes. We have at this point gone through the general process of what happens when a shipment is detained. There are other consequences of a detention. Let's go over these. So when a product is detained, all costs of storage, destruction, and sampling are responsible to the owner or the consignee. The PREDICT score determines the likelihood of the product being out of compliance. Delayed shipments can damage relationships affecting your ability to do business in the future. Also, refusals become public record, which has a negative impact on the company's image and can make it harder to obtain or keep customers. PREDICT stands for predict Predictive Risk-Based Evaluation for Dynamic Import Compliance Targeting. PREDICT is a risk-based analytics tool FDA uses to electronically screen all regulated shipments imported or offered for import into the United States of America. 
predict improves import screening and targeting to prevent entry of adulterated misbranding or otherwise violative goods and expedites the entry of non-violative goods. PREDICT uses automated data mining, pattern discovery, and automated queries of FDA databases to determine the potential risk of a shipment. It takes into consideration the inherent risk of a product and also information about the previous history of importers, manufacturers, and shippers. PREDICT presents shipments for further review based on its analytical results. Shipments with lower risk ranks and no other potential risks may be processed through FDA review more quickly than higher risk lines. PREDICT score is not public information, nor is it released. Additionally, money is lost. Product is either delayed or not delivered, which means profits are affected. Plus, the storage fees also cuts into profits. The worst part is when a detention could have been avoided by ensuring that your product is compliant with United States laws and regulations prior to shipping. So, how to avoid a detention? Do not ship over non-compliant products and ensure all submissions have been completed or updated prior to shipping. Adulteration and misbranding are common charges for drug detentions. Please note that this is not an exhaustive list of common issues that will result in these charges. A common cause of a drug product being detained is when the manufacturer listed on the entry documentation is not registered with FDA. It is especially common in the beginning of the calendar year when the facility was not re-registered between October 1st and December 31st of the previous calendar year. Another common issue is when the drug product is not listed properly. For human drug products, the product is required to have two NDC number assignments, whereas the animal drug is required to be listed under the private label distributor's label or code only. Products also must be certified every year when there are no changes. So in addition to ensuring that the product is listed, it also must have the most up-to-date information. If the product is not legal to market, that is by definition an unapproved new drug, and that will definitely be a cause for a detention as well as substituting ingredients that have not been approved for market or false advertising, all can be a cause to detain a product, drug product. FDA requires that manufacturers of drug products register its drug establishment. A manufacturer physically makes or manipulates the drug product. This includes packing, repacking, labeling, relabeling, analysis, and salvaging. Owning the rights to a formulation to make the drug product does not make a company a manufacturer. Each separate facility is required to be registered with FDA, that is manufacturing dry products for commercial distribution in the United States. The registration includes company name, physical location, establishment contact information, business operation, and for foreign facilities, importer information, and a designated United States agent who must reside within the United States. The registration does not only inform FDA what facilities manufacturing drug products, but also a record of how to contact the company in the event of an emergency, such as product recall or for routine inspection. The registrant is responsible for ensuring that the information is up to date and re-registered annually between October 1st and December 31st to keep the registration valid through the next calendar year. So in addition to not registering the drug establishment registration or maintaining the registration, a common cause we see for drugs being detained is the importer record is missing from the drug manufacturer's establishment registration record. Another submission requirement for manufacturers is drug products listings. A listing includes manufacturer information, labeler information, product information, such as ingredients and packaging information, such as package type, quantity, and labeling information. Each drug product is assigned at least one national drug code number, also known as the NDC number. The NDC number composes of 10 digits with three segments that identify the labeler, company, product, and packaging. Once the product is listed, it is important that the listing is maintained of any changes, including manufacturer changes or labeling changes, as well as certifying annually between October 1st and December 31st when there are no changes since the previous calendar year. If the product listing is not updated or certified, then the listing is not valid come January 1st and the product is subject to being detained upon entry to the United States. 
This listing is important to keep updated in who the manufacturer is and the manufacturer must have a valid registration. This manufacturer names in the listing must also match the manufacturer provided in the entry documentation. Otherwise, this discrepancy can also cause issues upon entry into the United States. The agency has serious concerns that drugs marketed without a required FDA approval may not meet modern standards for safety, effectiveness, effectiveness, quality, and labeling. Physicians and other healthcare practitioners, along with consumers, cannot assume that all marketed drugs have been found by the FDA to be safe and effective. For a variety of historical reasons, some drugs, mostly older products, continue to be marketed illegally in the United States without required FDA approval. The manufacturers of unapproved drug products have not received FDA approval and do not conform to a monograph for making over-the-counter drugs. The lack of evidence demonstrating that these unapproved drugs are safe and effective is a significant public health concern. For everyone's sake, please take the necessary actions to legally market your product in the United States. If you are unsure whether your pro drug product is legal, you may find this infographic helpful to go through. Please note it is not an inconclusive to all the pathways possible, as noted in the blue text at the bottom. This at least shows how not straightforward it is to determine if a drug is legal to market. Adulterate means to falsify a crop. A drug product is adulterated if the strength, quality, or purity differs from an official compendium or if an ingredient does not appear in an official compendium. Import alerts inform the FDA field staff and the public that the agency has enough evidence to allow for detention without physical examination, DWPE, of products that appear to be in violation of the FDA's laws and regulations. These violations could be related to the product, manufacturer, shipper, and or other information. Before importing into the United States, importers should know if their products are subject to detention without physical examination. Detention without physical examination allows the agency to detain a product without physically examining it at the time of entry. If the violation type is appropriate for analysis, you could obtain a report from a private laboratory as part of your testimony. If the analysis will require time past the respond by date to complete, it would be prudent to request for an extension as soon as you know it is needed. Misbranding occurs when the label contains false or misleading information. This could be due to the lack of information, whether it be the name of the manufacturer, packer, or distributor, or the contents within the packaging. A label is misleading if it lacks adequate directions for use, including warnings against use in certain pathological conditions. It is lacking warnings if used by children where its use may be dangerous to health. Another example is if the labeling lacks warnings against unsafe dosage, methods, duration of administration, or application would be grounds for the product to be deemed misbranded and not compliant. If there is a color additive that does not meet the criteria set forth under Section 706 of the Food, Drug, and a Cosmetic Act, that would be another example for a drug to be deemed misbranded. So some common issues Register Corp sees are labels are not in English, making unsubstantiated claims, leaving out ingredients, or stating that the strength is significantly higher or lower than what is indicated on the labeling or in the product. So in the event your product is charged with misbranding due to an issue involving the labeling, a form SD-766 may be submitted along with bond to request if the product may be relabeled or repackaged at port. This can be costly and time consuming, so depending on how much money is involved, this may or may not be a worthwhile endeavor for a company regarding the immediate cost. However, by foregoing trying to correct if possible, then the shipment is subject to refusal, which is public record, and can put a negative face for your company.
So we know more about what a detention is and why these can occur. So are there any tools to help you to prevent or handle one? So I can jump in and assist. Um, so when it comes to tools and um, so here at Registrar Corp, we specialize in making sure that we can assist companies in avoiding uh, potential detentions. Uh, we offer professional regulatory assistance and generally um, ways of making sure that everything from your labels uh, to making sure that your drug listings are all correct and accurate. Generally, when it comes to avoiding, um, tr avoiding detentions, you want to make sure that you do your work up front and that you don't get caught behind the ball. Uh, as Melissa so astutely pointed out, um, the entire process of going through a detention can be long and arduous. Uh, there's a lot of communication back and forth with, uh, with the officials at the port. And you want to make sure that, that the best way to avoid that scenario is to make sure that you are correctly um, going through your own documentation uh, and making sure that the risk of your supply chain is very low. Uh, so that when your predict score is not very high, that you don't have any detentions, uh, you don't have any DWPEs or import alerts on your record or your, your contract manufacturer's record. So here at Registrar Corp, we developed a tool just to help you with that. If you are a client of Registrar Corp, then you already have access to it. Uh, and the, it's not limited to clients of Registrar Corp. If you are not, currently using one of our services, you can get access to this system as well. Okay, so here on my screen, we have our FDA compliance monitor system. And so this is just going to give you a direct view into what, the, what it looks like when you are um, taking a look at what the potential risk is in your supply chain and see where you stand as far as your compliance with FDA. So as you are looking at your drug, your listed companies for your drug listing or your own facilities, you can go through and just look for where their potential high risk areas. So our compliance monitor system takes a look at all of FDA's databases and consolidates it into one place. So if you have uh, a contract manufacturer that you have here in the United States, you can see um, what their DUNS number is, their identifying information, but also what's their inspection history look like? Uh, do they have any warning letters? Uh, the import alerts that we talked about, where they're the automatic detentions, do they have those on their record? Any refused shipments? And, and just as important, do they have any recalls that are currently ongoing or issued by FDA? And you can go through, through the entire uh, to all of your suppliers one at a time and take a look. Uh, we also have registration numbers where we'll monitor the registration of each of your, your contract manufacturers because that's really where it starts. If your vendor or your supplier is not registered with FDA, then that can lead to a direct detention simply because the, the entry cannot be filed and it cannot be made. So you wanna make sure that they're registered. Uh, so that's the place where our system actually starts. Uh, but then when it comes to looking at some of the risk areas, I'm just going to show you a few examples of what some problem areas could be. So there are things like the in their inspection history, if you see issues with uh, potential failed inspections, uh, and that would be called an official action indicated, you can see what the categories are for that they had issues with, um, and then make sure that you get the inspection report or documentation related to that uh, to make sure that you address that issue adequately if you must continue doing business with them. When you have things like warning letters, I can show you an example of that. Um, we publish the warning letter directly here to our system as well. So you can go and identify, and let me click on that. So you can go and identify problems that FDA identified um, and what may impact your product, um, but generally your predict score to help you avoid those detentions. We talked about import alerts, which 
that is FDA's um, do not pass go uh, automatic detentions where they do not even uh, physically examine the product. So it's very important to know whether any of the manufacturers that you work with are on one of these lists as it may directly um, affect your product. Uh, so here we can see an example of one as it's displayed uh, and as it would look for what FDA reports. And you can see um, that their um, active ingredient um, it appears to be misbranded. And misbranding is a very uh, big issue when it comes to detentions with FDA. Um, we talked a little bit about a shipment being refused. And so knowing whether they, they have a refusal history, if there are any products that have been refused in the history of the company is extremely important. So we made sure to include that in the system as well. And then finally, we have uh, potential recalls. And so if you have any of your the ingredients in your product um, that may currently be um, in an ongoing recall or uh, your vendor generally had problems with that recall and with that specific ingredient in the past, that's important for you to know as you're doing business and marketing a product here in the United States. But generally, when you're looking at this, it's important to note that for each of these vendors, as you're working with them, as you're listing them on your registration um, at the point of doing business, this is generally what FDA is going to be looking at and including when they're determining what's your risk level as an importer, what's your risk level as a manufacturer, um, and should you be detained. And so all of this information is taken into account. So it's important for you that when you are, uh, when you are registering your facility, that when you are doing business, when you're considering working with other manufacturers, other pro processors out there, other packers, then that you are taking into account whether they're registered. You'll see that some of the companies here, uh, they may, um, they don't have registration numbers listed directly on our system, but that could be that FDA just hasn't published their um, or assigned their registration number yet, and it could be coming. So if that's the case, then you can also request um, additional information or request their, their registration information right here. Uh, and we make it very simple for you to do that. So you can just click there and it allows you to make a formal request to whoever your contact is at the company and ask them if they can provide any registration data for you uh, so that you can continue making that entry and make sure that you have all the adequate information. But having that information, like the registration, the DUNS number, is incredibly important as you continue doing business. So this is just to put all of um, the, the presentation in, in a little bit of context as well and uh, for you to see what it would mean for you uh, when you're going forward. Uh, again, if you are a, uh, a client of Registrar Corp, if we've registered your facilities or we've uh, done some of your drug listings, then you have access to this system and feel free to uh, reach out to us and we'll give you a training session, a direct training session on your account uh, and how to set it up. But also if you aren't doing any listings with Registrar Corp, you can also um, contact us and you can get access to this. Uh, it's available to you as well. So with that, let me jump back into the presentation. Thank you for that great presentation. Again, I'd like to announce that we will be sending a recorded copy of this webinar and a PDF copy of the presentation to all registrants. You may submit a written question during the webinar by using the Ask a Question feature in the top center of your webinar screen. So, <clears throat> our first question, can you help me without an NOA? That is a great question. Without notice of action, well, anything is possible. And it's always important to find out first what FDA wants than trying to guess what, you know, what the issue is. Um, also, if there's no notice of action, then there may not be anything to do at that point in time. FDA may simply have not issued one if it was just, you know, you just had it come in. Uh, the other thing is the product may just be under review. Um, if FDA is just reviewing the shipment, they don't have comment, um, there's really not much you can do at that point. 
when you get a notice of action that has that detention on it, definitely give us a call. We can look it over and, you know, provide some advice or assistance. Okay. Okay. Um, next question. Um, my product is under review. What can I do? I love this. Um, so it's basically saying, like, even without a notice of action, if it's under review, FDA is doing that. They're just reviewing the product. Um, I have heard sometimes a compliance officer may reach out to you and just ask you some other questions, you know, answer them. FDA asks you, you know, you try to provide the information that's been requested upon. You don't want to overload the compliance officer with all kinds of information. Provide information as it's requested. Um, but while it's being reviewed, do not move it, do not use it, do not do anything to that product until FDA is giving you the green light and says it's released. Okay, Clay. Okay. Um, are the same regulations applicable for dietary supplements as there is no product registration or NDC? Unfortunately, I am a drug regulatory specialist, which means I am very more into... Um, Expertise is more with the drug products. For dietary supplements, I believe that they fall under the food side. Uh, that's yeah, a great question. Sure. You could email to us, and you know, one of my other colleagues can definitely Jennifer help you with that Brendel, question. Please report to HR. Jennifer Brendel to HR. <laughs> if a drug substance which is not marketed as it is in the U.S. market, but it is formulated outside the U.S. and enters into the U.S. market only as a finished drug, should the drug substance be listed? Might it be subject love, to detention? I love this question. Sorry, I got a little excited there. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a question we get asked. I've been with this company for quite a few years now, and it's something I've gotten asked continuously over time. Um, and I've also asked FDA continuously over time. And it's one of those that if the product's being manufactured outside the United States, say an active pharmaceutical ingredient, and it's being manufactured outside the United States, never comes onto the United States territory uh, into our area as an active pharmaceutical ingredient, and it goes into a finished dosage form, as you guys stated that the active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturer is still required to register with FDA, but may not have to list its product. My best advice is, you know, if there's question that you could be subject to it, it's probably better to just submit it. So if you ever get a compliance officer or an inspector, as you may not know when your customers may be shipping it over and then they have an issue. Um, if you have inspection and that compliance officer interprets the regulation a different way that you should be listed, if you list the product, you're not going to have an issue in that respect. You're more likely to have an issue if you do And not get in trouble if you do list the product. Okay. Okay. Uh, my product is a drug. Why does it say medical device on the NOA? <gasps> We've seen this. We have seen this. And if it's truly a drug product and there's no way it could be a combination product, um, that's like in my presentation today, I kind of stated that sometimes a charge could be an error, that would be an example of an error. Um, unless maybe there's something, because there is definitions by US FDA of how products are regulated, how they're classified. Um, maybe if it's like, you know, you have an antibiotic ointment and it's on a bandage, but you don't think of that as a medical device, you're looking at your antibiotic ointment, um, the bandage would be considered a medical device. So it's hard to say in your specific situation if it's actually a charge that could be an error or an actual charge that you may need to really resolve. Um, but that's something where you, know, you could come to us, send us an NOA copy of your label, and we can review it and you know, try to assist you to figure out, well, which case is it. Okay. Thank you, Clay. Okay. What is an import alert? Oh, boy. What is an import alert? Hmm. Well... For one, it's a system that FDA uses to notify itself that, you know, there's an issue with the shipment. Um, 
and it's most likely going to get stopped. So these import alerts, they basically inform FDA's staff and the public, because this information is actually public information, that the agency has enough evidence to allow for detention without physical examination. So it's more likely that these products are out of compliance. And when you have this issue, you're more likely to have your shipments detained. So it's something you really want to work hard with trying to resolve. Um, but your import alert, you, you really don't want your facility to be on that list. OK? OK. Uh, what information do I need to add an importer? Right. To add an importer to a drug establishment registration, you must have the company name, which is probably the easiest part of all the information you got to collect, the DUNS number. Um, what's nice is with Registrar Corp, if you don't have the DUNS number, um, you can request us to get that number for you. And I'm pretty sure we don't do that any additional charge. And um, make sure you have the telephone number and the email address. All those four items you'll need. So in order to get a DUNS number, by the way, you have to have the address of the facility. So if you don't have a DUNS number, at least have the address. Because then, you know, if you come to us, we'd love for you to come to us. Um, we can get that information for you, so you don't have to go crazy looking for a DUNS number. Okay, Clay. Okay, we have been shipping our OTC drug for decades without assignment of two NDC numbers, and we never had a detention. So why bother at this point? Yeah, I haven't gotten caught. You know, so, you know. It's like that question. I never got caught speeding, so why should I worry about not speeding? You know, some people will say that or certain things. Um, that's like my favorite example. But, you know, for anyone, I guess even different countries, you all have laws, you know, especially for traffic particularly. And you have a cop on the side of the road. You go right by. He doesn't stop you. Well, just because they don't stop you that one time does not mean you're not breaking the law in that respect, that you're not compliant. Uh, or that you are compliant, even though you're not doing something. Um, it's just that compliance officer has not deemed it to be serious enough to stop it. At any time, a compliance officer at port, um, there's new compliance officers. Sometimes the FDA changes its priorities. If they move this up on the list, and you have not done the prudent thing to list the human drug product under both NDC numbers, then you're more likely to get stopped into um, a detention in the future. So if you take care of this issue now, then you don't have to worry about, okay, is this shipment going to go through or have that shock of when it does get stopped, like, oh my goodness, my product's been stopped. Why? And you find this out. You could take a step to be proactive and just not have to worry about getting this charge. Okay. All right. Next question. I have a lot of products on the shipment. Why were some products released and some detained even though they are the same product? So what is nice is that if you do have some products that are out of compliance and some that what FDA considers compliance enough, um, FDA will not hold the whole shipment. Uh, they will release products that they don't see an issue with. If they have products, especially if they mix like regulatory products, say if you have a shipment that's with cosmetics, um, drugs, medical devices, and you did not do add the importer to the drug re manufacturer's registration, but the medical device and the cosmetics are fine, they didn't see any issues. Then uh, FDA will just issue a notice of action for the drug products that have an issue, and the others will be released. But the drug products that have been named as detained, you can't move, alter, or do anything with until you resolve those issues and hopefully do not get a refusal notice. Okay? Okay. I've submitted my documents to FDA. Why is it still not released? <laughs> FDA, they have a, quite a big workload at times. Sometimes they don't get to it. Sometimes they're out of the office. Um, they have technically until the respond by date or even after. The respond by date is for you to submit your testimony to them. Then they can take the time to review it. That's why I harp on to really make sure you get some kind of receipt to make sure it was received. You don't want to just submit, sit there like, I'm done, and not have something to back you up that it was actually received by the compliance officer. It's always good to follow up to, hey, but you don't want to annoy the compliance officer. You annoy a compliance officer, they can make it even more difficult for you. Like, 
waiting till after the respond by date to give you a decision. So, you know, it, it's a fine line. Once you get that confirmation, you want to leave the compliance officer alone for a little bit and let him make his decision, get to it. Um, but you also want to check in because sometimes they do go out. They're not in the office. Um, yeah, so that's basically my best advice on that one. Okay, so we will now take our last question. Uh, what can I do to avoid detentions? Basically, everything I kind of stated in this presentation, no. The big thing is make sure you complete the submissions that are required for your specific regulated product, you know, if it's a medical device, drug, food, beverage, et cetera. Um, you want to make sure your submissions are done. You want to make sure your products have been manufactured um, according to current good manufacturing practices. Um, the, mo the service that my colleague Brandon went over today with the monitoring service is a great tool to find out if the shipments that you're shipping over, um, you know, if there's any issues, you can have a red flag and try to deal with those before you ship it over. Um, the big thing is, you know, when you have another uh, consulting firm that can help you with this, a regulatory side, they can help you look over for holes and make sure everything is, you know, have all your ducks in a row to try to prevent an issue. If you do have an issue, try to learn from it. Um, if you miss the importer, try to add something in your system, something in your SOP or, you know, your workflow so that when you do another shipment, you don't forget about notifying whoever's managing your establishment registration or if you're submitting it. Make sure to get that importer on that registration before shipping. Um, and that DUNS number can take time. So if your importer does not have a DUNS number, it can take up to two weeks to get one. So make sure you're doing your submissions, make sure your labeling's compliant, and you know, adjust your procedures as needed so you don't have repeated refusals or issues when importing into the United States. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Melissa. We are out of time, but you can send us additional questions anytime by email to info at registrarcorp.com. This concludes our presentation, and thank you for joining today.